Hope you all had a wonderful day today. I know I did. It was a good sports day, too. Oh, Charlie did? All right. <laughs> That's good. Tracy's not feeling too well. She's got some type of cold that's been coming upon her in the last week, so pray for her. See, she felt a lot better this morning than it started to hit her during the, during the afternoon, so she's home. She's not playing hooky. She's just home not feeling well. You know, Jesus was the best preacher that there ever was and that there ever will be. However, at times, he had many people who just refused to hear him. He went about preaching of the kingdom of heaven and many rejected his divine message from heaven. He showed his mighty powers and his miracles that he performed. And in these miracles that he performed, they were done to confirm the word, to show who he was, that he was the son of God. Now, although there were people who believed he had accomplished these uh, miracles. There's others that accused his power of coming from the devil. And many others, uh, seeing these miracles, they uh, refused to repent. Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 20 through 24. And we look at the religious leaders of the day. They, they sought to trick Jesus, and they wanted to find a way that they could accuse him. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 9 through 14, we see that in other, other places. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for their unbelief and as they challenged him to produce a sign. And Jesus said that, uh, that an evil generation seeks out a sign in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 through 45. So Jesus went about uh, teaching in parables. We talked about that in our... In our um, uh, last week when we did the introduction to parables, Matthew chapter 13, verse 10 through 13. And actually, that's what we're going to be in this, this morning, if you, I mean, this uh, evening, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 13. But the, the main problem that many were um, actually just dull of hearing, so Jesus taught about the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower was also called the parable of the of the four soils or the parable of the seed, or the seed and the soils. So in Matthew chapter 13, starting verse 3, we read, And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them. Uh, others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus teaches his disciples about these four different soils. See, Jesus is the sower. Matthew chapter 13, verse 37 states, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. What is being sown here? The Luke chapter 8, verse 11 tells us what's being sown. It's the word of God. The four soils are the hearts that men have towards the word of God or Jesus' gospel. The kingdom of God grows when the seed and the soil come together. There is life when the soil takes root and germinates. So where are our hearts? We look at each, each one of us, look at ourselves. Where is our heart? What is our soil? Well, let's look at the first soil. Some of the seed fell by the wayside. The wayside soil. This is the shallow soil hearts. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 4, it says, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road. See, this is the road by the side of the field. The fields in Galilee had no fences, and there are no paths. I mean, there, there are paths, and um, there are roads, or paths are roads, and 
they went through these fields. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 and 19, is Jesus' explanation. He said, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed has sown beside the road. So what type of heart is Jesus talking about? See, there's nothing wrong with the fertility of this soil. See, the, this, the soil just has not been plowed. The soil here is unprepared. The soil is hard. So the seed does not penetrate. This relates to the hardness of people's hearts. Luke chapter 8, verse 12. See, this is not that they don't understand. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, it states this. And listen, listen carefully to this. Because it says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, it does not understand it. The evil one comes and snatches away. And notice what he says here. What has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. See, the, the seed was sown in the heart, but it was snatched away. It was taken away. Here, and then Mark chapter 4, verse 4, mentions that the birds come in and they, they snatch that seed away. See, it, it, it cannot get down into the soil. It's on top of that hard soil. And the birds here represent the devil. This is what happens when the soil rejects the seed because it is on the hard soil. See, their condition is one of being blinded by the devil to the gospel. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, he says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God, the little g, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Yeah, the devil blinds them, snatches away the truth from their lives. C.S. Lewis, in his screw tape letters, he writes of such a man with a hard heart. He writes that, in the beginning, he, he's going down the path of faith in Christ. But he was so easily distracted by his hunger and the news headlines on a billboard. Just, just that, just little things could distract us. You can say, well, hunger, hunger is a big thing. No, because we're going to need to hunger and thirst after what? Talked about, yeah, last week or two weeks ago. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's what we have to hunger and thirst after. After, See, these types of people have the ability to learn and act. They really do. God didn't make them with, he didn't create them with, without the ability to understand. But their problem is they are unwilling. See, they are not willing to hear and to do. We all have that ability to hear. We all have ears. And to learn. But if we, one doesn't. We cannot say, if, I, if, I, if it was me, I cannot say that I can't understand it. God, I just, I just don't understand this. See, he gave, he gave the, the, the word of God. He gives his word for the common man to hear him gladly. The Bible talks about that. We can understand it. To say that I can't learn is a cop-out. How many do we see in society who are just not interested in the gospel? Have you ever tried to talk to someone about the Word of God, and they would rather be sitting in a chair at a dentist's office or at the DMV than to hear us talk about the about the you know God and the Bible. They don't, they don't want to hear it. They don't want the gospel. Get away from me with that. You know, a farmer has his whole heart into sowing the seed. See, a farmer is going to prepare the soil. He's going to plow it. He's going to cultivate. He's going to soften up that ground, that, that soil, so that seed can be sown deep enough to germinate. 
What causes hardness of the heart? And you know, there's many reasons. We don't have time to go through all those reasons, but I name a few, a few big ones. Pride. We talked about pride in the men's class. We talked a little bit about it in Wayne's class. Yeah, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 that we talked about. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Pride causes many people to resist. It causes many to trust in their self. It causes them to rebel against God. See, the Jews were this way. The Jews were prideful. That's why they committed spiritual adultery on God. Another one is worldliness. You know, that materialism and humanism and secularism have so many people under its spell. We know who's behind that. See, the devil uses these things to make sure that the word of God is not going to penetrate in people's hearts. Church stated, one may expose his heart to a common road to every evil influence of the world till it has become hard as pavement. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, Paul wrote, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of what? The hardness of their heart. Not God's fault. It's not their neighbor's fault. It's their fault. Are we this soil? Is our heart shallow? Are we preparing the soil? Is our heart soft and ready for the seed to penetrate? The second soil is some of the seed fell upon the, the rocky soil. This, this is the superficial heart. Matthew chapter 13, verse 5 and 6 says, Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprung up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. See, this is thin soil. It was, it was overlain with bedrock. Most of the land in, in Palestine was rocky. And there's different sizes to all these rocks that were all over the place. And these plants, they would grow quickly at first because of the type of soil, because of that moisture that was trapped inside the rocks. However, the sun quickly dries the moisture and the plants wither and the plants die. See, Jesus explains this in Matthew chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. He, he says, the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Excited. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. When that, that affliction in the world comes upon him, he falls. What happens to a person with this type of heart? See, the problem is, it's not the fertility again. Again, it's the depth. It cannot take root. This heart gets easily excited at first. Have you ever seen anybody who first hear the word of God and they're just so pumped up, and then after a while, where are they? They hear the word of God. They receive it. They're joyful about it. They run with it like, like a sprinter in a track meet. However, their zeal dies out because it was superficial. See, they were led by their emotions. They acted on impulse. They could see all the wonderful blessings of Christianity without realizing that there is suffering that comes with being a Christian. There's going to be affliction. There's going to be persecution. And they do not count the cost of discipleship. 
Luke chapter 14, verse 25. See, they are not deeply rooted in the gospel. There's no moisture there. Luke chapter 8, verse 6. Some of the troubles, the sun, it says. See, the sun here represents persecution. Trials and tribulations, affliction. When they are hit with these things, they are gone. They fall away. They cannot bear the daily cross. They cannot bear to make Jesus as their master and suffer for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Jesus. They're not willing to sacrifice. They're not real willing to suffer. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. See, we cannot just teach and baptize. We must develop new Christians, and we must develop those who are weak. We must attend to them. We must mentor to them. We must help them grow. But see, we could do all those things, but they must be willing to allow us to help them. Not everybody is like that. We must plan for the roots to run deep. We are not rooted in Christ. We are going to die. Look what Paul writes in Colossians chapter uh, 2, verse 6 and 7. He writes, Therefore, as you have received Christ, Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Now notice verse 7. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude got to have gratitude too, don't we? We have to be thankful for what Christ has done for us. And then Paul to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 19. He writes that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened, strengthened with power. Well, how, Paul? Through his spirit in the inner man. So that Christ, so that Christ may what? It says, dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, that you being what? He says, rooted and grounded in love. And be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. And to know that the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the, all to the fullness of God. See, we must be properly rooted in Christ. That's going to keep us from falling away from him. Yes, apostasy is real. There's people who, are, who fall away from the Lord. Sadly, far too many. See, this soil, this heart, received the word gladly, but was not grounded in the truth. Its foundation was superficial and weak. We must be grounded in truth. Third soil, some of the seeds fell upon the thorny soil. See, this is the secular parts. Matthew chapter 13, verse 7 says, Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. See, this soil is how my front yard used to look. It's how this property used to look, right? Crowded with what? Crowded with weeds. Yeah, I'm still reminded of that, though, when I step on goat heads every once in a while. Those are still all around. Got to be careful. Robertson states that the seeds of these thorns were already in the ground. So what do these thorns or what, what do these weeds do? See, they choke out. They rob the sprouts of nutrition, of water, of light, of space. They choke out the seed. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22 states, and, and the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. See, this symbolizes the cares of the world. This symbolizes the riches. See, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10 through 13, that riches do not deliv deliver what they promise, do they? How many wealthy people are out there and they're miserable? 
We could look at Hollywood at that. There's so many people in Hollywood who have millions and millions of dollars. And all of them are so joyful and happy and they have great lives, right? Yeah. Look at those chasing the mighty dollar. There's so many who are not happy. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong. And there's, a, there's people who have money who are happy because they put their priorities straight. They have their priorities are straight. God, there's a lot of people in the church who have a lot of money. But God comes first to them. See? God's their joy. The devil wants us distracted, doesn't he, from what really matters. You know, Martha was like this in Luke chapter 10. When Jesus goes to Martha's home, her, her sister Mary was attending to him. She was sitting at his feet. She was listening to the word of Jesus. She was anointing him with oil. What was Mary doing? I mean, what was Martha doing? Martha was a distracted with all the preparations. And notice what Jesus states to her in Luke chapter 10, verse 41. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Distraction. We get distracted by so many things in the world. The devil also wants us to be divided. Divide, he wants our loyalty divided, doesn't he? He doesn't tell us to stay away from God. He just wants a little piece of us, whatever he can to get us away from God so he could do his evil work on us. I wish I had my hat. I could kill that fly. We do that at home. It bother me. I just even wants to hear the gospel. Mark cha uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 states, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and he'll despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Are we allowing the cares of this world to choke out the word of God from our lives? Do we have divided loyalty? Luke chapter 8, verse 14 states, The soil, the heart, is choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. See, we cannot bear fruit to God when we allow these thorns, or the, we allow these weeds, the, the cares of this world, the, the deceitfulness, it says, of riches and the pleasures of this life to be in our hearts, to be in our lives. Thorns and weeds. The thorns of being unprepared. That's one of them. Unpreparation. Luke mentions this and gives a solution in Luke chapter 21, verse 34 through 36. It says, be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life, and that that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep on alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. What about the thorns of being preoccupied with the world? First Timothy chapter 6 verse 9 and 10 Paul says to Timothy but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs yes riches divert our attention away from the Lord Verse 17 of that chapter says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty, the uncertainty of riches. But on whom? But on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. All things to enjoy. Yeah, many believe that 
by being Christians, we can't enjoy this life. We can't be happy unless we're doing the things of the world. That's a bull-faced lie, isn't it? We have many things that God has given us, many blessings that we can enjoy. And then we got the thorns or the weeds of lust. See, when we sow to the flesh, it makes it impossible to reap the fruits of the Spirit that we see in Galatians chapter 5. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, it tells us that the earth, earthly pleasures do not bring true happiness. How many people out there are striving for those things because they think that they're going to be happy? You ever watch any of those uh, reality shows and they want to make it big, whether it's a singing competition, and they talk about how wonderful their life is going to be. But so many people in those industries wish they could just have their privacy, wish that they could just live a normal life. What about the thorns of other things coming before God? The thorns, the things that we, hobbies that we have, or the recreation, or sporting events. And you could think of so many things. There's many things that take precedence over God and his kingdom. But the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Put God first in your lives, and then let him do the rest. He's going to take care of us. We're going to have happiness. We don't need those riches. We don't need those problems of the world. The solution to the problem with the thorns, with the weeds, is to get rid of the problem. Pull the weeds from our lives. Right? We had a problem with the weeds here. What did we do? A lot of us, we pulled the weeds. Some more than others. They probably pulled more weeds than I did. But they pulled the weeds. Got rid of them. Made it look beautiful. Made it nice. Got rid of the problem. That's what we need to do in our lives with these things. The weeds of this life that that bring us away from the Lord. That leads to the fourth soil. Some fell upon the good soil. See, this is the successful heart. The successful heart, it's not about business. It's, it's not about money. It's not about social status. It's, it's not about being popular. This is the heart that is honest and good for the Lord. This is the heart that is all in for God. The Expositor's Greek Testament states this, heart is a heart, a wholehearted devotion to the ideal. See, it's fully devoted to God and his word. That's what the good soil is. That's what the good heart is. In our text in verse 8, Matthew 13, it says, and others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. See, this soil has depth. It has space. It has moisture to grow and to bear a very nice crop. And so what is the evidence of a good and an honest heart? It's one who hears and learns. It's one who understands. It's one who grows. It's one who walks in righteousness. He bears much fruit to the Lord. Matthew chapter 13, verse 23 says, This is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Mark chapter 4, verse 20 says that this heart accepts what it hears from the Lord. But so many like to question the Lord. And I'm not talking about asking questions so they can learn and grow. I'm talking about you teach them about God. You show them the truth. You, you, you bring them to the understanding, but they still question it. See, they do not accept the truth gladly. They don't keep to the truth. But we must do so. We must stand firm and the word, eight, uh, Luke 8, verse 15. A good example of this that we all know is in Acts chapter 17. The Bereans, right, they, they, they committed to God. They, they were fair-minded people. 
And the Bible states in verse 11 of Acts chapter 17, it says, they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Are we searching the scriptures daily? What are these fruits that he's talking about here? The fruits of bringing the lost to Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 13. The fruits of living holy, living righteous lives. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. The fruits of walking in those fruits of the Spirit that we see in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. All those beautiful things from God. And the fruits of good works, Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. And there's other fruits that we read about in the Bible. And notice what he says here. There's many different stages of maturity. So the, the fruit that is born is not all the same, right? Because some are mature in the faith. Some are starting to get there. Others are new and, and they're just babes in Christ. They're just learning. So the fruit of their faith is going to vary. Some are going to have larger crops than others. Right? And this is not a competition. We don't look at others and say, wow, look what they're doing. We do what we could do. But the idea is to uh, think of the f of farmer. Keep, keep plowing. Keep cultivating. Keep attending to the crop. Harvest. Keep doing it, so on and so on. That good soil. That's what we want to keep in our lives, on our hearts. So I ask, what type of soil are you? Where is your heart? Is your heart hard? Is it on the rocky soil? On the thorny soil? Or do you have a good heart? Do you have a heart for God that you want to do His will every day and to serve Him every day? That's the soil. That's the heart that we all want to continue to strive for every day that we live so we please God. And the lesson is yours tonight. If you need prayer, if you need to answer the invitation tonight, do not hesitate. Come now as we stand and we sing the invitation.